All right, we're cooking with gas. Father, we thank you for this morning. Please give us wisdom as we get into some very challenging passages this week and next week. Open your word and open our hearts to hear it and understand it rightly, that we might live with the assurance and the confidence you give to us as your children. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the uh, Romans chapter 9, where we're at, last week we began it. Uh, and if you recall, the little kids, by the way, darling, are upstairs with Miguel. Am I supposed to be up there? You can go. Are you doing, are you doing? I'm doing during the service. During church. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Sorry. Sorry. Are there, are there? No, no, not little okay. ones. Okay, they're okay. 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 Right. We're good. Sorry. <laughs> Romans chapter 9 ends with Paul expressing his grief. He is grieving the fact that his kindred, his fellow brothers and sisters who are Jews by blood, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are not in the covenant. They rejected the Messiah and therefore are not part of the chosen people of God anymore, as it were. And he's confessing, you know, I would give up my own salvation if, if they would believe. I would readily, willingly go to hell if they would come to faith in Christ. Okay, I can hand that to you. <laughs> uh, and then he starts talking about, uh, it is not as though the word of God failed because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And that's kind of confusing. Uh, and, and what he's getting at is not all those who are the bloodline of Israel are Israel today. <laughs> And what he's going to do is make the distinction. There's those who carry the blood of Abraham in their veins. And there are those who share the faith of Abraham. And those who share the faith of Abraham are the true descendants of Abraham, part of the covenant. And just because you have his blood in your veins, that doesn't count without the faith. Okay? And that's where he's getting to. So this is where we're picking up. Verse 7. Neither is the case that all of Abraham's children are his descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. How many children did Abraham have? Two. <laughs> Isaac and Ishmael. Actually, I actually, am I recalling that he had more after Sarah died? I have to go back and look. I'm, some, some things that resonate with me that he may have had more afterwards, later in life. He's an old man, Sarah dies. I think he remarries, but I have to go back and check that. But obviously, Isaac and Ishmael are the main ones. You remember the story? Sarah was barren, couldn't have any children. Uh, she, in wanting to give Abraham an heir because Eliezer, his chief servant, was going to be his heir, uh, she gives her handmaiden. Abraham, you know, have a child through my maid, and that can be your heir, you know, through her, her slave girl. And so he has Ishmael. And Sarah uh, is extremely jealous. Uh, you have a Sodom and Gomorrah account where the three travelers come. Uh, and Abraham greets them, feeds them, uh, converses with them to head on towards Sodom. They are angels, and it says Abraham is left standing before the Lord. Not an angel. God in human appearance prior to the incarnation at Bethlehem. And in that encounter, the Lord tells Abraham, this time next year, Sarah's going to have a child. And Sarah is, is eavesdropping in the tent. She laughs. And the Lord says, Sarah, why'd you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. She lied directly to God's face. I mean, you get that, okay? <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, and you're going to have a child. And what is the child's name going to be? Isaac, which means laughter. laughter. Because Sarah laughed. How can I, when I'm old, have a child? Isaac's born, and in fear of competition for being heir, Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. Okay, uh, so that there's no competition. Ishmael's not going to be Abraham's heir. God meets Hagar and Ishmael on their journey. He's like 12 years old and says, I'm going to bless Abraham's descendants. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be a great nation. I think he says, you know, kingdoms will come out of you. I think he even says 12 kingdoms or something like that are going to come out of you. Okay, so they're blessed and God takes care of them. Abraham's descendant, but the son of promise through which the messianic promise is going to come is through Isaac. Okay. And Ishmael is blessed. And uh, the vast majority of the Arab world today traces their lineage back to Ishmael. Okay? Uh, so, Isaac is the chosen child. 
through which the promise given in the garden of the Messiah is going gonna, is gonna to go. So he's making his comparison. Not all the children of Abraham are counted as belonging to God. Ishmael was not part of the promise, part of the covenant. God was going to bless him, but he wasn't in the line of the promise. Isaac was the son of promise, and Abraham's true descendants came by way of the promise, not blood. Ishmael's descendants did not become the nation of Israel. Isaac's descendants became the nation of Israel. That's what he's making the distinction of, okay? Uh, Genesis 12, 21, but God said to Abraham, do not be concerned about the boy and your slave. Whatever Sarah says to you, listen to her because your offspring will be traced to Isaac. Sarah said, send Ishmael away. Send you know, Hagar away, all right? That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. Okay. What's his argument? We look at Abraham's descendants as being those who Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the line of promise, the nation of Israel. Abraham had other descendants, but they're not the promised line. So he's saying there are other physical children of Abraham, but they're not part of the part of the promise, the line that would carry the Messiah. That's his point. He's making that you know there are those who are from the same daddy. But different circumstances. Is there any record of Abraham having kids when he was a young man? No. No, he was a young man. I, I said, something that seems in the back of my mind is thinking that when Sarah dies later, he has some more. Yeah. But right now, you know, he's 100. He's, he's, he's 90. And Sarah's 80? Or 180 when Isaac's born. I mean, they're old. Old, old. Something like that. Uh, Abraham's descendants by promise, not blood. Galatians, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Okay. We'll get back to this idea. Uh, what was it which marked Abraham as unique and set him apart? Faith. Abraham believed the Lord and was credited to him as righteousness. And you've heard me say this many times before. Abraham was not the only believer in God at the time God called him. You know, leave the land of earth, the house of your father, travel to the promised land, the land I'm going to give to your descendants. He takes a lot with him his nephew, he was not the only believer in God. Okay? As far as we know, Job was a contemporary of Abraham. He lived about the same time. Job was obviously a believer in God. Abraham was chosen and he believed God's promises. Okay? He was chosen for that specific purpose of bringing the Messiah. But this is the statement of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. So God spoke directly to Abraham of the birth of, his, of a son of promise. Isaac's birth was foretold, and it was a miraculous birth. Beyond the physical ability to have a child, she conceived and had a child. Okay? It is miraculous. Uh, God tends to do that, because Jesus' birth, obviously, was miraculous, the son of promise. Different circumstances, obviously, but still miraculous. The Lord, Yahweh, said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind her, because she was eavesdropping. Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come back to you, and in about a year, she will have a son. Because what was Abraham's son? How is this possible? I'm too old. She's too old. How's this going to happen? Okay. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time, God had told him. So it's not impossible for God. And not only that, Rebekah conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. Now Isaac, Abraham, and Sarah have Isaac. Isaac has children, and who are they? Esau. Jacob and Esau. Okay. So God continued his promise through the children of Isaac. Okay. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord heard his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. And you notice my note. They were married 20 years before she gave birth to her, to her twin boys. Not tw identical twins, but the twin boys. 20 years. It was also an answer to prayer. A barren woman conceives and has a child of promise. See a theme going on here? God is very much involved in making this happen according to his design. 
Do you have a question, Kevin? Yeah, when you talk about children of the promise, I mean, I guess I missed it. I look, I blinked, missed verse eight, but it was. Um, when do we come in? We come in because we share the faith of Abraham. Right, but are we here yet in verse eight? No. Well, but it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise. We right. Yeah, that's what he's writing to the Romans. He's saying. He's saying, we are the children of promise by faith. We're not the physical descendants of Abraham, but we share the faith of Abraham. That's his point. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are part of the promise because of faith. We're connected to Abraham, and we are his descendants. Yes, Paul is talking about that to the Romans. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the history. <laughs> Back then, it was all about the physical promise. Getting the line of the Messiah you know, completed all the way to Bethlehem. Started with Abraham to Bethlehem, or the garden to Abraham to, the Be to Bethlehem. It's a physical descent. Once Jesus comes and does the cross, it all becomes a, about faith. And but you become right. the one who's... Eventually, we're all part of Abraham's promise. Yes. Right? Okay, I'm just asking, are we, are we there in verse 8? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. Just checking. Sorry, I misunderstood so your question. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, verse 11. For th through her sons... For though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to election might stand. Okay? We're about to get into the hardest part. God chose Jacob over Esau to be an heir of the promise and the, and the one through whom the Messiah would come. Now the next verse, it says, Not from works, but from the one who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. So getting the whole context. In verse 11, you got to get the context. She is told, Rebecca's told, she's going to have two boys, and the older is going to be to serve the younger. Do you think that the older is going to like that? No. Nope. Where's another story where that comes into play? Another account. Adam and Eve. Huh? Adam and Eve. No. Joseph, his coat of many colors, has the dreams, and his brothers are going to serve him. And they get mad and try to kill him and sell him off as a slave. Okay? All that happens is because this arrogant little snot thinks he's going to reign over us. What ends up happening? He's right-hand man of Pharaoh, and they do serve him. Okay? God revealed that to him in a dream. Okay? So, uh, God chose Jacob over Esau to be their promise. Now, not based on any merit or worthiness in them. It was the grace of God. So, go back to the passage. For though our sons had not yet been not been born yet or done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to election might stand. So it's not based on what they've done. It's not about their works. That's an important thing right now. Not about their works. Look at the passages. In the same way then, there is also at the present time a remnant chosen by grace. What then? Israel did not find it, find what it was looking for, but the elect did find it the rest were hardened. Like Pharaoh's heart. God hardened his heart. You want to you be an unbeliever? You want to suffer the judgment of God? Okay, I'll give it to you. Remember five times Pharaoh hardened his own heart. First five plagues. Then God hardened his heart. You don't want to repent? You don't want to listen to me? Fine, I'll give you the full measure of my judgment. Okay. Ephesians. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to, the, to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself according to his favor and will. In 1 Thessalonians, knowing your election, brothers, knowing your election, brothers, loved by God. So the point is, was it based on works? It's based on grace. Okay? Why? Because that's where we're getting to the challenging part. It was not from works from the one who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. God revealed it to Rebekah that the younger will serve the older. This was the choice of God. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. Now, God's choice is not based on any works or deeds done by Esau or Jacob it was purely God's choice that the promise would descend through Jacob not Esau but there is a reason 
Now, remember the account of their birth? Esau is born first, and they would tie a piece of string or something around their, their arm when they came out. The first one to come out, but there's twins. So we can make sure that, that this one's older, and so you know which one. That's the birthright. Yeah, his birthright goes to the firstborn. Right. But Esau comes out red and hairy. <laughs> like, like really hairy. And Jacob comes out smooth skin, holding on to Esau's heel, taking board. So Jacob, what does his name mean? Deceiver. Deceiver, the one who grabs the heel, who trips you up. Deceiver. That's his name. So he carries a very negative name. So his name is changed by God to Israel after the wrestling match. Okay? Um, and Jacob is a smooth-skinned mama's boy, and Rebekah caters to him. And Esau is a rugged man of the earth, and Jacob caters to him. So you've got this competition between mom and dad and the two boys all their life. Okay? It is written, I have loved Jacob and Esau, but I have hated Esau. There's your passage. There's the one that is so difficult to understand. And I'm going to give you my explanation. Okay? Flat out. The word in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to love less, to dislike strongly with an implication of aversion and hostility, to hate and detest. Dictionary definition. The Hebrew word to hate, to be unable or unwilling to put up with the sight, you know, the sight of someone. This verse has to do with the choice of God for Jacob and the rejection of Esau as the bearer of the promise. Esau despised his birthright. By despising the birthright, he despised God. Rejection of God, no faith, births damnation and judgment from God. Evidence in history of the relationship between Israel and Esau's descendants. Do you remember the story? Esau comes in from hunting. He's famished. He's, he's, he's going to die. He's so hungry. And Jacob says, I've got some stew. I'll give it to you, but you have to give me your birthright in exchange. Now, is Esau going to die of starvation? No. He's hungry. It's, it's a, what a good is a birthright if I'm going to die? So he sells or trades his birthright for a bowl of stew. That is literally ridiculous. And he despises his birthright. Now, in his mind, what's, is he really going to, you know, he's going to go around and get the birthright anyway because he's daddy's favorite. But he despises the birthright. He despises the promise of God. In the end, what he's doing is he, you know, because do you think they were ignorant that eight of the story of Abraham and the birth of Isaac and, and how God had, had sent Ishmael away and Isaac was the, the one through whom the promise was going to come? Do you think Jacob and Esau knew those stories? Absolutely. So all of a sudden, here's Esau who knows he's to be the one to inherit the promise of the Messiah. And from his descendants, Messiah came. He sells his birthright. He doesn't care. He doesn't believe, have faith in God. Jacob, not that he has honorable motives, steals a birthright. Point is that it is not, as some would say, that God, from the foundations of the world, hated Esau and rejected him, as in sending him to hell. But Jacob believed in the promise and wanted the birthright. Esau despised the birthright. Therefore, it's not hatred in the sense of, of you're my enemy. It's detested him, didn't favor him. It's not that God rejected Esau for being Esau. God rejected Esau carrying the promise because he had no faith. So the word hate is a very confusing word because it's a lack of love. That's not how it's translated. It's not a lack of love. It's a lack of choice. Okay? Because of his unbelief. God is not going to bless the unbelief. Esau was, in a sense, an unbeliever. He did not believe in the promise. That's how I understand the passage. And that falls in line with the election and predestination paper we gave. It's not that God predestined Esau for negative stuff. God knew what Esau was going to do ahead of time because he knows everything therefore God worked out his will through Jacob 
not Esau, because Esau, he knew what the choices Esau would make. Because he knows everything, he accomplishes will to those who are going to believe. That's the hardest passage. And, it, and the evidence, the last line, Israel and Esau, Arabs and Jews, pretty much. And you got Ishmael's mixed in there too. So you got Ishmael's descendants and Esau's descendants, who are the people of the Middle East, except for the Jews. And we know what their life has been like, their relations together. Anti-Semitism is strictly hatred for the Jews, okay. the Semitic people, you know, but it's, it's hatred for the Jews. That's how the term is normally used. It's hatred for the Jews because there are people who believe that, like Hitler, destroy the Jews because they've screwed up the world. Okay. Not because mm -hmm. the Arabs are Semites. They were not Semites. No. Well, Jews. the Semitic peoples, I don't know how you would actually define that, but the, the way we use it in the world today, anti Semitism is hatred for the Jews. And, and there are still people today who believe the Jew, Jewish nation ought to be annihilated. Just because they're Jews. They think they control the banks, they think they control everything. Yeah, they were blessed by God, obviously, throughout history. But once the Messiah came, the special favor of God upon the bloodline of Abraham ended. And the special favor of God upon those who have the faith of Abraham was, in a sense, enacted. Because now it's about faith in Jesus as Savior. So uh, we haven't really got to the point quite yet of having the same anti-Semitic view toward Christians. Because now, see, we're the chosen people of God. But because, and I mean, think about it. What did Satan try to do over and over again? destroy the Jews, keep the promise from happening. Okay, What does he do today? He's, they were still viewed in the world as God's chosen people. Destroy them just because of that. And then also destroy the Christians because we're God's chosen people. The way you keep the name of Jesus from being spread is to kill those who spread it. So... Uh, Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. It turned, I turned his mountains into wastelands and gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. God made his choice based on his foreknowledge. He did not make Esau despise his birthright, but chose based on what he knew Esau would do. So, God, before the world was created, knew Abraham would have Isaac. Isaac would have Ish uh, Abraham would have Ishmael and Isaac, and Isaac would be the bearer of the promise. And he knew Isaac would have Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob would be the bearer of the promise. Why? Because they believed. They held on to the to what had been handed down to them. Any thoughts? They're hard words. Well, they, they are. But, but see, we want to we want to speak where Scripture speaks and be silent where Scripture is silent. There are those who want to go a step further. Jacob I love, Esau I hate it. So God created Jacob for the purpose of being uh, Esau. God created Esau for the purpose of being despised by God, hated by God, cast into hell, and judged for all eternity. That's what God determined to do before the foundation of the world. That stands in direct contrast and contradiction to God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus died for the sins of every person in this world, that, that salvation is freely offered to everyone who will believe. So you either deny those scriptures and make your idea of how God views Jacob, Esau, fit, or you hold on to the truth of the gospel and say, what is he talking about? He's not talking about I hate you and I'm going to cast you into hell. He's talking about, I favor Jacob over Esau because Jacob believed. And I despised Esau because of, the, because of his unbelief. Okay? 
that the word hate here isn't like the hate we know today. And so was, that's what I'm trying to, to yeah. show you is to love less, to dislike strongly with the implication of aversion and hostility. I'm giving you dictionary definitions mm -hmm. of the words that are used so you understand it's not hatred like we think the word hate, and yet hate is the closest you can get to in English. Okay. So what should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. That's Paul's point. Was God unjust? to choose Jacob over Esau? Is God unjust because Jacob was chosen to bear the promise and Esau was not? Esau was an unbeliever, did not believe in the promise. Jacob was a believer, wanted the promise. To say God is unjust to deal with Esau is to say God is unjust in sending every unbeliever to hell. Is God unjust because an unbeliever is cast into hell? No. But there are a lot of people who say, well, if God's really a loving God, he's not going to send anyone to hell. There is no place called hell. Rob Bell, who, what was it, 10 years ago? Yeah. 10 years ago or so, wrote the book Love Wins. He was a megachurch pastor. Was it Megatur Love Wins? Megachurch. Megatur megachurch pastor. What does the book Love Wins reveal? There is no such place as hell. We all get to go to heaven no matter what. Not like the Methodist bishop who sent Steph and I down at a lunch table and convinced to tell us that religion is like a lighthouse with panes of glass. You've heard me talk about that before. Yep. And one pane of glass is really dirty and dingy, and that's Islam. The light comes through, but it's not very clear. And one pane of glass is dirty and dingy, and that's Jehovah's Witness. And one is Mormonism, and one is Buddhism. But you get around to another pane of glass that's really clear and clean, that's Christianity. The light comes through the most clear. But all the truth is in all of those. And God's going to save all those people in all those religions. There is no hell. There is no judgment. No. What determines, and notice Paul was very clear not based on works, not because of what they did. What determines heaven or hell for a person? Faith. Where there is faith, the grace of God has been applied, there is salvation. Where there is no faith, a person goes to hell because Jesus is not their savior. You don't, a, no one is ever sent to hell because of sin. Sin does not send you to hell. The rejection of salvation in Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, i.e. no faith, sends a person to hell. Once you get to hell, then you're judged for your sin. And that's a whole another discussion we ought to have some time about degrees of punishment. Now, uh, Dante, Dante did the, um, Dante's Inferno, yeah. the descent into hell, the levels of hell, and you get down to the very bottom, and it's not fire, it's ice. Ice so cold it burns. That's how he visioned it. And there are only three people in the bottom layer of hell receiving the greatest judgment. Who were they? You need to know this. Dante is known. Dante's in front of Brutus and Cassius for having betrayed Julius Caesar and Judas Iscariot for having betrayed Jesus Christ. Only three people in the bottom level of hell, according to Dante. Because there's nothing worse than betraying a friend. His, his whole mentality comes into that. All hogwash, but okay. The, uh, there are degrees of punishment. And all you have to do is understand that God is a just and fair God. I'm not going to suffer in hell for Katrina's sins, okay, or Teresa's sins, or Bobby's sins. I'm going to suffer in hell for my own sins. It's not like everybody's shoved into an oven and it's 400 degrees. It's I get God's judgment on my sins, and Bobby gets God's judgment on his sins, and because our sins are different, our judgment is therefore different. For you judge for every sin. You take my Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is this idea of degrees of punishment. Just as on the flip side, there's ideas of degrees of glory. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're honored by God in eternity. He blesses you. It's not, you're not earning brownie points in relationship because the relationship is relationship. But you are rewarded. And so there's degrees of punishment, degrees of glory. It's a whole other study. So, uh, some passages. 
But because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment is revealed. And, no, and now may the terror of the Lord be on you. Watch what you do, for there is no injustice or, parti or partiality. partiality or taking bribes with the Lord our God. And that's an interesting thing. Now the terror of the Lord be upon you. <laughs> Yeah. Now the blessings of the Lord be on you. Now the terror of the Lord be upon you. And we're listening to me, young men of understanding. It is impossible for God to do wrong and for the Almighty to act unjustly. If God is God, and we understand he's pure and holy and righteous in every way, there is nothing negative in him in regards to him choosing Esau over Jacob. Okay? And if God is purely love, then God cannot hate with our understanding and definition of hate. He can favor one over the other because of who they are and what they believe, but not hate in the sense of despise and hate as we use the word hate. We have to redefine hate in the Bible. Okay? Uh, where he tells Moses... I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. On what basis does God give mercy and compassion? Love and faith. Whose faith? The faith of the individual. I, you know, as a Christian, as someone who is a believer, I have the mercy. What is mercy? So his mercy and our faith. Yeah. What is mercy? I do not get what I deserve. What is grace? I get what I don't deserve. Mercy is not being punished as I should be. And what is the basis of me not being punished as I should? Faith. Faith in the promise. Faith in the Messiah, the blood of Jesus. Which means I'm not going to get what I deserve. That's mercy. Grace is the opposite. I get what I don't deserve, which is forgiveness and life. So God's going to have mercy on whom he has mercy. But who does he choose to have mercy on? Those who believe in him. Those who trust in him. Those who do not trust in him, are they going to receive mercy? Hell has no mercy. Okay? Whom does God show mercy? Those who believe the gospel. He said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name Yahweh before you. I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So Paul is quoting God. Remember the cleft of the rock? God tells Moses, you can't see my face and live, but I'll put, put you in the rock. I'll put my hand over you. I'll pass by. I'll put my hand, and you can see my back, which is a weird idea. I mean, how God has a back. <laughs> you know, God's glory passed before him. But what, but, you know, to see, to, to understand that faith brings all these blessings, mercy, compassion, love, forgiveness, eternal life. And the lack of faith brings everything that's opposite of that. And, and, and we can't get confused. God has made his choice. Those who have faith will receive mercy. Those who don't have faith will not receive mercy. He knew that before the foundation of the world. He didn't make you not believe, but he will have mercy on those who have believed, and he's known it since eternity. And he will not have mercy on those who do not believe, and he's also known who those are for all eternity. Doesn't mean Jesus didn't die for them. It means they rejected what he freely offered. There is free will. That's the rub. It's, we made our choices. And that's not God's fault. So then, it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. Man cannot go to God. God must come to man. I just need to set it up. Oh, okay. Uh, First Timothy, God desires all men to be saved. God wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus died for all. But it's mercy. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. Grace, the opposite. Grace is receiving what you don't deserve. I just went through all that. Uh, remember, and that's the, 
that's the, the rub. And that's where we have a hard time. If someone dies and goes to heaven, who made that happen? God. God did. Because you can't come to faith. You can't believe in Jesus as your Savior apart from what? God the Holy Spirit coming and offering to you the forgiveness that Jesus won for you on the cross. For by grace be saved through faith and that not yourselves. It's a gift of God. The Spirit comes and, and is here. I am here to, to save you. And you have two choices. You can say, nope, I don't want it. Or here I am, I'm yours. And if you don't resist, God creates faith and you belong to him. If you resist and say, no, I don't want it. I don't want Jesus as my Savior. You're not forgiven. If someone dies goes to hell, who made it happen? You. They did it themselves. That's the crux. It's actually literally called the cross of the theologian or the crux of the theologian, the cross of the theologian, that if someone is saved, God did it. If someone is damned, they did it themselves. Because human standards, we want to put it the opposite. If someone saved, God did it. If someone's damned, God did it. If someone saved, I did it. I made the choice. Someone's damned, I did it. We want to put our, either God in both or ourselves in both. And it's God on one side and us on the other. If I'm saved, God did it. If I'm damned, I did it to myself. That's what scripture reveals. But we like to tie it up in a neat ribbon. Either God does everything and is responsible for everything, or we're responsible for everything. I, I made the choice for Jesus, so I go to heaven. I didn't, I go to hell. I'm in the driver's seat. I don't see how you separate the, the works issue. I mean, if you try to homogenize it instead of letting it be all of God, I mean, I just don't understand how it doesn't become a works based salvation. It does. Uh, ultimately, it does. Because if, if my salvation is based on me, even my choice. Well, okay. um, not to be combative, but yeah. Esau's was. It, Esau's was. I don't think it was, but I'm saying what we were talking about earlier, I mean, it, it, it's really funny, this entire chapter, it just gets deeper. deeper. Yeah, it does. We get, we get into the vessels of wrath. Yeah. Yeah. Created, created for destruction. Mm -hmm. So I think Esau was, you know, created for destruction. Well, but but based on what God knew. See, that's it. his foreknowledge determines his actions. What he knows determines what he does. And so because he knows Esau is an unbeliever, he therefore acts and, and, and goes forward acting, accomplishing, creating, or whatever, based on what he knows to be true. Not that he's making it happen, but he knew it would happen. That's the rub is... is we can't really get into the mind of God. It's, it's above our pay grade. But we know that because he already knows someone's an unbeliever, <clears throat> he's going to send them to hell. He didn't make it happen, but he knew. So he knew from the, from the foundation of the world, this person was going to die and go to hell because he knew they weren't going to believe in Jesus. Did he make them not believe? No, he just knew it in advance. And that's the whole thing with Esau. And Paul's already talked about you know, this predestined and all this stuff. And that's where it gets confusing. God knew Esau was going to reject the promise before he was born. And so God already knew Jacob was going to be the heir of the promise before he was born because he knew Esau's heart before he lived. And that is beyond our ability to fully grasp that God is carrying out his plan knowing everything that's going to happen along the way. It's like your own salvation. Hey, think about it. And I've, I've shared this with you before. God knew in advance how many times you were going to hear about Jesus and harden your heart and say, nope, I don't want it. Before the time came, and you finally, when you heard the message of Jesus once, your heart was softened and the spirit were faith and you believed. So let's say it was going to take a hundred times to hear of Jesus before you believed. He came to you, maybe as a small child, in a storybook about Jesus and the cross. And it was a nice story, but you didn't believe it. There was no faith. Came to you a little later, something else. And every time, wow, only 99 more to go. Wow, only 98 more to go. And God is looking at the end result. He knows every time you're going to say no. And he's excited because it's one step more to the one, to the number 100 when you don't say no. And he works faith and celebrates you. But why do you why do you change? I mean, 
why is just not a billboard that Jesus loves you and died for your sins converting the whole world? Because, because think, everything... Because the Spirit of God is moved in that soul at that time. True. But everything is a war. And that's appropriate imagery. God has invaded enemy territory. This world belongs to the devil. And your fallen sinful nature caters to the things of this world. And everything in this world is tugging at you and trying to convince you that you don't need God. You can be God yourself, which was the original deception. You don't need God. You can take God's place. And it's only when you figure out, I can't be God for myself, that you're going to soften and yield your heart. Because everything in this world is pulling you away from God. It's a war. God's at war for the spirits, soul, spirits of humanity. And the devil is at war to hold on to them because they come into this world belonging to him. He don't want to let them go. And God has invaded enemy territory to rescue, which is exactly what his first sermon was. Okay? Coming to set the captives free. You know, coming in, invading enemy territory to rescue. That's what the cross was. That's what the spirit coming is. That's who we are, resident aliens. Which is actually the name of the book, Resident Aliens. A foreigner in this land. Because this is not our home. We're here for a purpose. This is the, you know, we're part of the kingdom. This is the fallen world. I think a lot of it is environmental too. Because if you're nurtured from when you're really small with the word of God, We're going to hear today in the children's lesson, because our focus today is on children. And, and yes, I think God is ready and willing to work in the life of a young child, and it's much easier for the Spirit to work in the life of a young child than an older person. You become more cynical, okay? Uh, but we're going to hear today about a girl who was raised in an atheist home, who God came to. How? I mean, argue all you want. She says she had a dream and. You know, God told her mom I met God last night at four. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and there are stories, you know, around the world where God is appearing in dreams, Jesus appearing in dreams, people in Iran, Iraq, places like that. Uh, what we know, and that's where I have to be real careful, what we know is we've been entrusted with the scriptures and the messages of gospel to proclaim. That's what the church needs to do. God's not limited to that. But we can't count on anything else. This is what God has given us to do. Preach the gospel. If God wants to do something else, in a dream or whatever, God can be God. This is what we're about. Okay, this is what he's given to us. The word and the sacraments to, to be the church in the world today. God is not limited to us. He's given us the tools for us to use. This little girl painted one of the most well-known pictures of Jesus, modern-day pictures of Jesus, at eight years old. Having met Jesus in a dream at four years old. Okay? Isn't that a movie? No, I don't, think, I don't think a movie. It comes out in a movie. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I got pictures on the screen for it. Um, yeah. So, and, but she was in an atheist home. And so it's like Jacob and Esau. They're raised in a home where they know the stories, they know the promise. One holds on and believes the promise. One despises his birthright, doesn't believe the promise. They're raised in the same home. And we see that today. How many kids, Christian families? You know, four or five kids. They raise their kids. They teach them the same thing. They love them the same way. They take them to church, everything. And, and you know, two or three of them, you know, straight and narrow, one of them off the deep end, drugs, alcohol, everything else. Everyone's going to make their own choices. Happened in my family. Yeah. My kids. I mean, we work with what God has given us, the tools God has given us. We try to be faithful to that and, and trust that God's going to, when they go off the rails, God's going to bring them back. He's brought most of us back, for sure. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's stop here and pray. All right. Father, thank you for getting us through some tough chapters, some tough verses, for giving us a little bit of clarity. These are hard and deep words, but we know arching over all of it is the truth of your grace and your love and your desire for people to know Jesus as their Savior. So even if we don't fully understand everything, let us not lose sight of that, that you want the people of this world to know you. Use us, Father, as simple vessels to carry the message and reveal you to the world. Bless us as we gather for worship. In Jesus' name.
Let me tell you real quick what we're doing. 